Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Dr. Quentin Felt. He's a fisheries research scientist with duties related to ensuring the ecological integrity of the Mississippi River for future generations. As of recent, he's been tasked with investigating the effects of Asian carp on the river biota. He's jumped headfirst into this nationwide program problem. So first, I would like to thank you for your work, and second, I would like to thank you for being on the program. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I really appreciate this. So um, I don't think probably a lot of people know much about Asian carp. Um, who are they, what are they, and what's their relationship to the Mississippi River? Okay, so I, I think it's I think it's important to talk about at least first as it relates to Asian carp. You know, when when were they brought here? Why were they brought here? So I'll, I'll briefly go into that. So so Asian carp they were introduced uh, to control water quality in some of our southern states' aquaculture facilities. And and what I mean specifically by that is that they were introduced into these facilities. To control, uh, to control algae, um, and the reason that the aquaculture uh, folks were using this as a tool is that in these systems where they're where they're feeding uh, catfish or hybrid striped bass that they're growing out to to, to get to market, um, any of the any of the food that's not consumed, uh, those nutrients are actually used up by uh, by algae. And then that, that algae then, then translate to, to a very off-putting taste uh, that the hybrid striped bass or the catfish that were being cultured would actually take on. So they're, they really take on the taste of the, uh, the environment that they were in. So if you have a, uh, an environment that has a very high algal abundance, um, that's going to tr- translate to, to a fish that has a really pungent uh, flavor. So... So what they were doing is that these Asian carp were brought in to, to knock down that algal problem, um, and then in turn that would uh, that would increase the, the flesh quality of whatever you know whatever product, be it hybrid striped bass or catfish or whatever it was, it would actually increase the, the flesh quality of the product, and you know the, the consumers would then be happy uh, that they would have a good tasting flesh. That they were actually bringing home to their family. Well, so that's sort of where the the nice, happy story really ends. Um, The second part of this is that... Wait, when was um, this? This was like late 70s, early 80s is when all this happened. So that they were brought over here about that time. And then then at the end of all of that... um, this is really in that really in that same that same time frame. Um, as we as we all know, there's there's very there's catastrophic events that occur um, in our world all the time. And every time that we try to take a species from some natural from its natural range and we put it somewhere for some po- supposed biological benefit, if it does get out of that area, uh, many times it will have a negative effect on the biota that's present in that in, in their native range. So, so really, what, what what I'm saying here is that with the Asian carp back in the 70s and 80s and 90s, when they were in these aquaculture facilities, there were a series of catastrophic floods that actually inundated these locations. And then um, the fish were able to make their way out of those aquaculture facilities and then into naturalized naturalized water from you know, aquaculture facilities into smaller streams and tributaries. And then eventually they made their way into our large river, uh, the Mississippi. And as everyone knows, you know, the Mississippi River is basically the highway the aquatic highway for the transport of, you know, all kinds of fish uh, throughout, essentially throughout the country. Um, the two biggest rivers that are associated with it, which is the uh, Missouri and the Mississippi, that expanse that expanse uh, essentially covers the majority of the United States. So, um, with carp in the Mississippi River now, um, they've expanded their range, uh, and I'll talk about maybe why they've expanded their range so much in just a second, but 
because of this aquatic highway that they have, there's just the ability for them to move throughout the country. So um, maybe a little bit as to why they've expanded so much, uh, why their range is, 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 is so large now. Well, so, so where, this, where this fish is native to, which is the Yangtze River Basin in China and other locations, um, the, the characteristics of, of, of that river, at least where they're native to, is very similar to what we see in the Mississippi River. Um, so you can imagine if you take, uh, you know, you take this fish uh, and you put it in, into a new system, into a novel environment um, that it's never experienced before and it has a very similar characteristics to, to its native range, it's going to do well. Well, you, you put on top of that also that, you know, here where it's invasive, uh, Asian carp don't have, don't have a naturalized predator. So that's that's really another factor that has led to this this great expansion. Um, as it relates to the expansion, these fish are 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 very good at migrating very sh long distances over a very short period of time. We've actually we've actually implanted uh, ultrasonic transmitters in some of these fish. And uh, we had specifically we had one female that we uh, that we implanted a, a transmitter into. Um, this fish moved a matter of 400 miles in just in just seven days. So, and the other the other part of that that project really that that was that was so interesting is that we were actually putting transmitters in these fish to figure out where the congregations of carp were. So as a as kind of as a Judas fish, uh, Judas fish technique, where you where you tag one fish, you track it, and you try to find out where the congregations of all the other fish were. Well, the big problem with our study was that you know each each fish was moving into very different locations, so there wasn't any massive congregations, at least as it related to several of these marked fish or several several of these telemeter fish going to one specific location. But what we were, what we actually did find is that there were massive congregations of these fish absolutely everywhere. So there wasn't really any rhyme or reason, but just carp everywhere in the river. So the so so that really leads to you know some some big problems to try to control these fish if they're everywhere. How are we going to be able to uh, uh, try to control them? Well, that's going to take a, a lot of manpower. Um, not to say that it couldn't happen. Because uh, it certainly could. We've been able to uh, uh, eradicate a lot of species uh, uh, from environments, but um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a little while. Another another really key characteristic of this fish is that it has a super fast growth rate. You know, relative to our native fishes, this fish is growing you know uh, much much faster than our natives. And uh, the other the other part to that is that. You know, I said that there's not really any naturalized predators out there, which is true, at least when they get up to that, you know, 10, 15 pound range. But as it relates to the young of year uh, carp that we have in our river, um, those fish grow at this just astonishing rate. And, and, and all of the predators that are out there, like gar and catfish and bass and walleyes, you know, when the carp are small, they can consume them. But what happens is, is that they just have this very, 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 very efficient filter feeding capacity, um, and they could just grow at a super, super fast rate. So, and th and that's in comparison to our native fishes. So that the native fishes really don't stand a chance in terms of uh, being able to grow and to survive because these because these carp are just eating them out of house and home. So. So that's a that's a big problem. Um, the the very the very basis of this whole problem relates to what carp eat. Carp are carp are planktivorous, meaning that they're consuming zooplankton and phytoplankton, and that's the that's the very base into the food web. So you can imagine with this. You know, with this ever-expanding uh, Asian carp population, uh, 
um, very efficient filter feeding capacity to consume a lot of uh, a plankton out of the water column. They are they're simply eating uh, all of that plankton that's needed by our native fishes. So if you remove the base end of the food web or you reduce that the abundance of that base end of the food web so low, our native fishes really don't have a chance to uh, to grow and to survive. And a lot of people think about, well, it, you know, this isn't a really big problem because there's not a lot of our native fishes that eat plankton. Well, and, and in fact, there are. There's 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 actually three species that that depend on plankton throughout their life uh, that we see in the big rivers. One is a one is a buffalo. Uh, two is a gizzard chad, which is a very important prey species, and then three, and probably the coolest fish in the Mississippi River that used to hang out with the dinosaurs, uh, is the is the paddlefish. Um, so there's direct competition for that planktonic resource uh, throughout their life with those three species. Well, but they say, well, well, Quentin, well, you know. But bass and, and bluegills and crappies and all these sport fish that are that are important to me, well, there's no real direct competition uh, with with carp because they don't eat plankton. And and I always have to explain to them, saying, well, you're you're partially right um, that you know bass and and, uh, and and walleyes and you know big catfish, you know they're predominantly eating uh, fish when they're adults. But when they're when they're at their most vulnerable stage, which is directly after hatch and when they begin exogenous feeding, they depend on that uh, that planktonic resource. And you can imagine uh, if, uh, if if these very small uh, a baby fish don't have that plankton resource uh, to eat, they're not going to be able to grow, and then ultimately they're not going to survive. So that's that's really the that's really the root of the problem is that the carp are just simply uh, eating all of that base end food web plankton, and then it doesn't leave any for our native fishes. And and, and I, another another way, uh, Derek, that I like to think about this is that if you have a swimming pool, you can only fit a certain number of people into that swimming pool. So if we think about if we think about filling up a swimming pool with uh, a, a bunch of native fishes and we're we're at some level, and then we start throwing carp into that swimming pool, eventually something's got to give. Uh, someone's got to get out of the pool, and and because of their because of their 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 abilities, the Asian carp's abilities, uh, they are able to uh, to competitively uh, exclude. Uh, native fishes. So, so that's 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 really the that's really the way I like to think it to think about it. And we really need to, and I'm sure we will as we as we move on with this conversation. But as we as we've as, as I sort of talked about, you know, these Asian carp they're 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 really bad on our aquatic ecosystems and 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 specifically to our native fishes. And we need to really be thinking about methods that we can uh, go about at least beginning to think about how we can control them or reduce their populations to a point where we can ensure that native fishes like really cool fish like paddlefish or sturgeon, uh, those kind of prehistoric uh, mega fishes that, uh, that have been around for eons can, uh, can remain in our systems where future generations of, you know, natural resource uh, conservationists like ourselves can can enjoy those uh, in the future. So I know you said this a couple times, but I just want to emphasize this because it's pretty stunning that, okay, the Mississippi River is really big and there is a lot of plankton in there and recognizing that, you know, there is no surplus in nature, that somebody, you know, Every, somebody's going to eat the plankton one way or another, that doesn't alter the fact that this means there are a lot of carp. If there are so many carp in the Mississippi River Basin that they are actually consuming so much of the algae in this huge river that they are significantly affecting populations of other planktivores. I just want to emphasize yeah. that. That's, 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 
the Mississippi River is so big that that's pretty stunning to me. Well, and 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 there to be honest, I mean, I'm not. We don't have we don't have specific documented evidence that they are reducing the plankton. However, what we do have is that we have a direct association between this this increase, this this exponential increase in silver carp um, that's being followed by a simultaneous decrease of our native fishes. There is some evidence uh, from the Illinois River where the plankton, um, specific species of plankton, are being reduced, likely related to silver carp. So I'm not specifically saying that the amount of plankton in the river is is changing, but what I am saying is, is that species abundance or or the plankton that is needed by our native fishes may be in jeopardy with respect to how much these carp are consuming. So I just wanted to cl- I wanted to right. clarify that a little bit. But I think we're I mean we're saying essentially the same thing, but I just wanted to put some clarity on that. Right. Because I don't right. have data that's saying that plankton numbers are declining. I have I have evidence that says that it's likely that the simultaneous increase of of uh, silver carp and big heads uh, has been uh, is is in direct relationship with uh, a negative or, or decline in uh, some of our native fishes, and that and that negative that that decline that I'm talking about is also in accordance with the change in the the plankton composition of the Mississippi River Basin and particularly the Illinois River. Right. So. Yeah. Th- thank you for that. Um, so before we talk about the range of the carp. Um, I'm wondering if you can do like a two to three minute digression on paddlefish um, since they, A, are so cool, and B, since I'm guessing a lot of listeners have not heard of them. So can you do, can you give like a two to five minute um, introduction to this wonderful species? Sure, sure. So so paddlefish are a, uh, you know, they're a prehistoric uh, mega fish that that got to hang out with the dinosaurs and have made it uh, for many many moons uh, on this planet. Um, they're a really unique looking fish. They have a uh, a very long uh, spatula shaped uh, rostrum or nose, um, and they're and they are planktivorous throughout uh, throughout their lifetime, which means that they're basically swimming around. Uh, essentially 24-7, uh, filtering the plankton out of the water in order to gain that nourishment that they need to be able to grow and survive. I also call them a megafish. Um, these fish have the capacity to grow over 150 pounds um, and, you know, can be five or six feet long, depending on uh, depending on where you're at in the country. Uh, this fish, uh, historically... Uh, in the Mississippi River, um, it's always been there, but uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, due to habitat modifications in the river, and uh, there's been there's there's thought that um, these habitat modifications, coupled with you know everything else that's going on with the environment, base of species like you know silver and dickhead carp, are leading to the decline of this uh, of this of this very I don't know beautiful mega fish that we have in the river. Um, another thing about, you know, about paddlefish that's, that's, that's so interesting is that um, at least in some portions of the Mississippi River Basin, these fish can still be commercially harvested. They're predominantly commercially harvested because they're a row-bearing species. Um, so when that's processed, uh, you know you can create black caviar. And there's been uh, there's been the collapse of of several uh, several sturgeon populations throughout the world that have really increased the demand uh, for for black caviar, other sources of black caviar, and and one of these potential sources is uh, is the paddlefish. So uh, so so right now there are there are there is still some commercial fishing that occurs uh, to satisfy the demands of, of this black caviar industry, 
which is sort of troubling because, you know, uh, because because paddlefish are because they mature at such a late age, you know, it may be 10, 12, 10, 12 years before they become mature. Um, and and then the other part about it is, is that they don't spawn every year like, you know, a lot of our other native fishes. Um, so it's really troubling, you know, if, you, if you're only spawning every, you know, two to three years and then, you know, you're, you're not becoming reproductively viable until you're 10 or 11 years old. And then once you become viable, you know, you get harvested. Uh, there, there could be problems with the population or the problems with, you know, sustaining that. If, uh, you know, commercial fishing were to, uh, I don't know, increase. I think right now where we're at with the paddlefish population is that um, we really don't know the status of the, we really don't know what the status of the fishery is yet. And that's what we're working on now is to really figure out where the population stands and, and how or what the impacts of commercial fishing are on this population. But it's troubling uh, to have any, you know, if there's if there would be, you know, big problems with a commercial harvest on the species, it could be problematic uh, as we move forward to ensure sustainability. So thank you for and that. Go ahead. Yeah, and, I, and, and one other thing that I'll say to that, Derek, is that, you know, a lot of times we want to implicate um, we want to implicate one factor as 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 being the driver of you know the collapse of the paddlefish population or the you know I, I don't know any fish. So we want to implicate one thing, and and the fact of the matter is is that you know even though commercial fishing does you know it it may have an effect on the population. There's a heck of a lot of other things, just as I said at the very beginning of this, that are that are that are likely influencing the paddlefish population at the same time. Invasive Asian carp, you know, they're a huge problem. So how do we parse out? And I think that's I think that's that's something really big here is that how do you parse out the effects of of Asian carp, the the huge habitat modifications that have occurred to the river, all these dams that are in place that impede the, the spawning migrations of, of paddlefish. Um, and, then, and then also, you know, you have this commercial fishing, uh, the, the problem of commercial fishing. So you, you add all those together, and, and yeah, you may see, you, you know, you may see problems in the population, but it's really tough to implicate, you know, one of those sources. So uh, it may be Asian carp that are having the most effect, or it may be the dams are having the most effect, or it may be commercial harvest that's having the most effect. It's no. going to be really, it's going to be our job as, as fishery scientists to begin to identify what those mechanisms are and how we can begin to curb um, to curb the problems, if there is problems with the paddlefish population, uh, to get them to, to, to ensure that we can have paddlefish populations for future generations. You know, I was I was just talking to a friend of mine a couple of days ago who works on um, water issues in the Columbia River, and one of the things that, you know, I talk a lot about salmon, and I also I, I talk a lot about dam removal, and that's important. And um, I was talking to her about the the collapse of salmon runs on the Columbia, and she was reminding me that the um, the um, the Salmon were having problems before then that started with the canneries, and I'm just saying the same thing that these problems. You know, when you talk about salmon, it's easy to talk about dams, but there's also um, uh, logging. There's also problems with the ocean. It's all multi. There are multiple it, it things is. going on at the same time. Yep, there it, it really is. And and one one other thing that you know, if we want to throw in others to the to the mix, you know. You think about sedimentation and erosion into our big rivers and how that may be impacting, you know, the amount of plankton that's out in the water. Um, you think about global climate change and, and, and all of those factors. You know, you start you start really stepping back and really looking at the big picture. And it, and it is. I mean, we sh I'm not saying that we shouldn't be picking on invasive species because we should. That's oh. something that we can prevent. Hold on a second. Um, There's a the phone's yeah. ringing. I just tried to hang up on it, but it might be my mom. Hold on. Oh, okay. Hello. Hey, I'm doing an interview. I'll call you later.
Okay, bye. Sorry about that. We'll we'll I'll ask uh, them to delete it at the place. Anyway, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, no, that's that's all that's all good. I, um, I, I, anyway, I, you're saying about, was, about invasive species. Yep. Yeah, I was just saying that you know it's 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 there's a there's a multitude of factors that are going on: climate change, sediment, you know, erosion, uh, you know, invasive species, habitat modifications, you know excessive harvest, whether that's, you know, from whatever factor, it could be recreational or commercial harvest. You know, we, when, we, when, we, when we really step back and look at the big picture of all of this, it's, it's important, to, it's important to, to look at, you know, each factor and, and what's, what's having the most effect. And I think that, you know, I think it's really important to look at invasive species because that's something that we may be able to do something about right now. I think that I think, and I'm not I'm not discrediting all of the other things that are going on. Those are much, much bigger issues. Um, this is something that we can do today. We can start we can start uh, reducing that population of of, of Asian carp uh, through controlled efforts to to try to reduce or eliminate the effects that they're having on you know our native biota. You know, so, I always. I always think about this in terms of sort of a medical model. You know, if somebody goes to the hospital and yeah. they have some other condition, but at the same time they have an infection that's causing a fever, I mean, they recognize that, you know, you've got – like I think about this in terms of, of HIV, that people would present at the hospital with, you know, seven different um, actual opportunistic diseases that are harming them, and they would then – treat each of these and they would they would do triage you know figure out what is i don't know if that's the right word here but they would figure out what is the that's not the right word they would figure out what is the most crucial to do right now and they would deal with the fever that's killing them right this minute and then they would deal with you know whatever does whatever other disease next and it seems to me it's the same sort of model can be applied to the mississippi river it's like there are all these concerns and now we can have you know try to figure out which one is the most crucial to deal with immediately Absolutely, and I and I think that's my job as a as a fishery scientist is to is to begin to identify those factors and 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 figure out ways that figure out ways that I can minimize those effects, uh, regardless of whatever it is that we're talking about climate change or invasive species or habitat modifications or sediment erosion, uh, etc. That's so, my job is to be able to figure those things out. How can we have an effect? So let's talk about the range of Asian carp. So Asian carp, okay. they started, they, I, I presume since you said catfish, I just presumed you meant like Louisiana. Did they start in the south? Where did they start yeah, and they, where are they now? They, they, they started in the south and, and the specific states, I, I, I don't know the specific state. There's different, uh, there's different suppositions out there, and I don't want to implicate any one state. Right. Uh, but it started. It started in the south, in the Mississippi River Basin. At least that's where, that's where, that's that's what the, uh, I don't know. That's what the paradigm says, anyway. Um, oh, I just want to make now, one comment. I just want to make yeah. one comment. That this just sure. annoys me no end. That so yeah. often you'd think we would learn this lesson, having made this mistake so many times, of putting in a non-native species to do some control, just like you suggested at the beginning. Right. But it's like there is going to be there is going to be a flood. There is going to be a disaster. And it seems like we're not really learning this lesson and continue to bring in species to new places. I keep thinking about, you know, the Africanized bees in South America where they brought them in to see what would happen if they bred African bees and European bees if you're going to do that, you should do it in the place where if something bad happens, you should prepare for a catastrophe. That's all I'm saying. And it seems yeah, like we I, never no, do. I'm, I'm, I agree with you. I agree with you totally. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so sorry, yeah, go so, ahead. So, yeah, so, so – and that, you don't want – that's a really good point. We continue to, to introduce these species outside of their native range for some supposed benefits and, and – there's always some negative there's always going to be some negative effect from that if that population that non-native or invasive becomes established 
it just like goes back to that same sort of uh, that pool example that I have. You know, you have a certain number of uh, of critters in a pool, and you start putting new critters that aren't native to there in that pool. Something's got to give, and and most of the time, the the non-native or invasive is going to uh, to exclude the, the native. So so yeah, but it, but anyway, so where where these guys are now? So um, they are they've made their way all the way up the Mississippi River into Minnesota. Now there is a barrier. Uh, they haven't made it above the barrier in Minnesota, and I don't know which lock and dam that is, but um, do know that they're in Minnesota. They've made their way up the Missouri River, and then they've subsequently made it into the James River, which the James River goes all the way into North Dakota. So there's uh, there's Asian carp in North Dakota on the Missouri side. Um, of course, they're all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and then on the Ohio River, um, again, no specifics, but I know they're all the way up, at least the well-established populations, all the way up to the Kentucky River, which is uh, which is there in Kentucky. Uh, so they're 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 they've really expanded their range, um, and and are essentially occupying the the majority of the middle United middle of the United States. I mean, they're they're everywhere. So, um, are, you, are you there, Derek? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm here. Um, okay. Yeah. It, it, it. You know, I was just, before we talked, I was reading about a, a lawsuit um, where um, some of the states, uh, one state, I believe, wanted to close some canals or close something, I don't remember what, um, in order to protect the fisheries in the Great Lakes. And yeah. um, canal, basically transporters were fighting this suit. Um, sure. And I, I, don't know, I don't know the specifics of the lawsuit that you're talking about, but so one of the, one of the biggest issues with, with CARP and, and really why they've gained so much traction as of recent and why everybody's talking about them one is that they jump out of the water like crazy, but but two is is that there is the chance that these fish uh, could make their way into the Great Lakes, which the Great Lakes is a you know a multi-billion dollar fishery um, for a whole host of uh, a very important species, and uh, people are very very worried about you know the impacts to their livelihood if you know Asian carp were able to get into the Great Lakes. And I'm not, you know what, I don't want to discredit that at all because I, I think that is, that's a very, very important issue. We don't want, uh, you know, the Great Lakes are, but the Great Lakes are probably one of the coolest ecosystems that we have here in, in, in North America. And I'm not discrediting that at all. Um, but, you know, I, you know, from where I work, which is the Mississippi River, has this direct connection to the Illinois River, and the Illinois River has a direct connection to the Chicago Sanitary Shipping Canal, which has a direct connection to um, to the Great Lakes. So, so, so when I think about this problem, I think about what are the what are the benefits if I were able to reduce the population here, right here on the Mississippi. I see that as kind of a there's 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 multiple benefits to it. One is, is that I'm going to ensure that those really cool native fishes that I hear, like you know the prehistoric paddlefish or, or or gizzard shad, which is a hugely important prey species for a whole host of critters in our uh, in the Mississippi River ecosystem, um, and then and then buffalo. We're going to see you know if 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 we can if we can reduce the abundance of uh, Asian carp in this stretch of the river, we're going to have positive effects on those guys. The other thing is, is that by reducing the population here, although it may not be a direct connection, we've, we've, we've inadvertently reduced that pressure on the Great Lakes. Well, so you say, well, well, that doesn't really make sense. But what, what we do know from, from a lot of really, really interesting research that we've done here is that, that Asian carp, and I kind of talked about this earlier, is that they can make these very, very huge migrations. So 
regardless if a fish is, uh, is, is hanging out here one day, within a matter of a couple of weeks, it could be challenging that electrical barrier that's, uh, that's at the Chicago Sanitary Shipping Canal, uh, which makes its way into the Great Lakes. So when we think about this Asian car problem, and I think this is really what I'm alluding to, is that, you know, we all need to really work together because these fish are moving throughout all these different river systems, um, we really need to work together to try to reduce the populations. Yes, one of the benefits would be to reduce the to, to reduce the uh, chance of them getting into the Great Lakes. But the other benefit to it is is that you know all these really cool fish that we have in the Mississippi River Basin, um, by reducing the Asian carp population, we're increasing the chance that we're going to have sustainable uh, populations of our native fishes for future generations. I know I keep saying that, but that's probably the most important part of, of, of trying to knock down the, the Asian carp population, is that we've got to maintain, we've got to maintain these native species that we have. You know, if, you, if, you, if we eliminate one, what are the, what are the ecological ramifications on the, on the ecosystem? We don't know. And I don't think we want to test that one. Uh, that's not a good one to test. If you take one out, what happens? Well, we may not be able to see anything, you know, right away, but maybe it's, you know, several years down the road that we see, wow, boy, by reducing uh, or, or by eliminating or, yeah, by eliminating paddlefish, we've had, you know, direct negative effects on, you know, some other part of the ecosystem that's hugely important. So we just have to be super careful, uh, we, we just have to be super careful that that doesn't happen. So we all need to work together to try to reduce this population of Asian carp. So they're, they're moving. They're moving freely. Right. These, these carp have an aquatic highway, kind of like what, what I talked about earlier. You know, the Mississippi River is is this huge aquatic highway where, where fish can essentially move freely throughout the country. And, uh, you know, it may, be in, it may be in Missouri one day, Louisiana the next, and, uh, well, maybe not that quickly, but... My point is that it could, the fish could move from from Missouri to Louisiana to Minnesota to Kentucky, you know, maybe into Indiana, um, maybe into Illinois. You know, I mean, one fish can move all over this all over this interconnected waterway that we have here in the Mississippi River Basin. So it's it's just really important that we all work together. I guess that's what my point is. So I think that's that's really great and really important. And thank you for saying that. And I think. You know, when you and I talked before, and one of the things you made clear that time is that this is one of the rare environmental problems that does have that that does can be alleviated a little bit um, through a very simple means. And that started with me asking you the question, "What do what do these carp taste like?" So, yeah. can you dive into that? Yeah, yeah. So that's you know, carp, if we think about eating a carp, the first the first thing that people do when you say, oh, I'm going to try some carp, people kind of cringe. And, and the reason that is is that there's just a backlog of, of I don't know, there's just a backlog of, of, of I don't know, I don't know what, the, what a good word is for it, but it's that these preconceived notions that that someone has about eating something. So if you say the word carp, uh, it's like, oh man, that's going to taste terrible. And I think I think where a lot of this stems from is that um, when when common carp were brought over to the U.S., which has been over a, a century ago, you know those fish were brought over here as a delicacy from Europe. You know, every, we're all, oh we're going to feed the world with you know with with common carp. And this was – common carp were predominantly consumed by the, the, the well-to-dos. But then eventually, you know, um, there, were, there, was, there was a series of crises in terms of, you know, people needing food. So then people were actually digging ponds in their backyard, and it didn't matter if you were well-to-do or if you were poor or, you know, whatever, whatever economy class that you were in uh, – people were digging ponds in their backyard and putting common carp in them. So then what happened was is that that, that prestige of, of or that delicacy, the 
just that delicacy of eating, you know, common carp wasn't there anymore um, because it was available to, to, you know, all, all these different classes of people. So that, that, that really is translated uh, into people viewing all carp in this, uh, in this one sort of under one umbrella. And really, that could not be further from the truth. You know, common carp are a very different uh, critter uh, than than both big head uh, and silver carp. Uh, common carp do consume uh, organisms that uh, are in the benthic environment, so they're they're predominantly a bottom feeder. Whereas silver carp and big heads, they're consuming plankton, so they're they're eating uh, they're eating organisms that are up up off of the, the bottom, actually uh, in the water column. So the taste of the flesh from a, when you're comparing a, a silver carp or a big head to a common carp is much different. You know, the other, the other beauty of, of, of eating uh, a silver carp or, or big heads relative to, uh, uh, to, relative to some of the other fish is that, you know, the, the organisms that that, that silver carp and big head are consuming have a very short generation time. You know, a lot of times you hear about by bio, bioaccumulation of toxins and flesh and, and, and all that. Well, the nice thing about what a silver carp or a big head carp eats, which is plankton, has a very short generation time. So they're not in that environment for a long time. They don't bioaccumulate uh, those, 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 trace, those trace metals that, uh, that can be injurious. So We've actually done some uh, recent work on uh, on on some of these uh, toxicants in the flesh, and, and actually found that that silver and big head carp were well below any EPA threshold um, that they have for advising you, know, you shouldn't consume more than you know X amount of fish per week or per month. So there's no uh, there's no stipulations on that, which is really nice for the fish. The other really nice thing about this, and I did a, uh, I, I did a video shoot with uh, with Andrew Zimmern from Bazaar Foods, and he, you know, he said, Quentin, the, the, the best thing about this, uh, about eating Asian carp, is that it's like you're not really eating fish. Most people really don't like that, you know, really fishy taste, and this fish doesn't have that. That's a really white, delicate meat. Um, my my father is a my father's a chef and he says that uh, he says that the the coolest part about the fish is that you know it has that it has the ability to take on the flavor profile of whatever seasonings that you throw at it. So if you want to make fish tacos one night, you can do that. If you want to make fish and chips, you can do that. If you want to make uh, a Asian carp on a stick, which is a that's a really really cool recipe. It's got the uh, it's got ginger and brown sugar and sriracha and sesame oil, and it's it's basically put on a skewer and put out on the grill. So there's there's a bunch of different ways that you can prepare this fish, um, and all of them are 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 very very good. We've actually did some um, some blind taste test trials where we had uh, Asian carp paired up with uh, two of the most consumed fish in North America, one being tilapia and two being catfish. And what was really cool about uh, our blind taste test is that, you know, if, if people didn't know what they were consuming, whether that was, you know, catfish, tilapia, or carp, uh, they preferred to eat the carp two to one over tilapia or catfish. We had 307 people that participated in that blind taste test, too, so it wasn't like, you know, we just went down and asked our buddies. We actually made a you know, a, a formalized study out of it to, to make it all happen. So um, that, the, this fish is delicious to eat, um, and, and what we need to do is we just need to get it on the plates of uh, more families in, in, in our world, and, and uh, we wouldn't have this big problem that we have right now. You know, it's, it's, I, the, one of the things I think is really cool about this is that so many of the problems we face um, – have either more complicated ways to alleviate the problem or ways 
I mean, this is a consumeristic, a dreadful consumeristic society, and we actually have a way that by simply consuming, actually consuming something, you can actually help. I mean that, and consuming yeah. food. I mean, this is this is an extraordinary yeah. thing, it seems to me. Yeah, we have, you know, we have all these problems with, with people being hungry and, you know, not enough protein and, and, and all that. You know, here's a here's a chance for us to to take a step to, to begin to fight some of those, you know, worldwide problems that we have by providing a good quality protein source to to everyone. You know, a lot of people always say, well, well Quentin, can't we just turn this into dog food or can't we just turn it into cat food or something like that? And I... You know, I I think that's a I think that's a, a, a very good idea, um, if that's if, if that's in the cards for us to do. I say, I say, man, we have a quality protein source. Why not? Why not let uh, Why not let humans eat it? I mean, it's it's absolutely delicious. So we've got got all these other problems going on. I mean, this seems like a this seems like a solution to at least begin to address some of those issues. So, so why isn't there a market developed yet for these fish? And and I I will say that there are there are some markets out there uh, for the fish. Is there still an overabundance of carp in the river? Absolutely. Um, the reason that this really hasn't taken off yet is that. The commercial, the commercial uh, fishers that are actually out trying to, you know, make a living uh, of catching fish on the river for their family, the uh, the price per pound on on Asian carp is so low. By the time that they pay for the gas, and by the time that they pay for their nets, and by the time they pay for their boat, and by the time they pay for their truck. It just simply doesn't make economic sense for the commercial fishers to go out there and fish them. So there has to be there has to be some incentive. There's there's at least a, as as I'm aware of, there's not a quality protein source like Asian carp that you can get out there for twelve or fifteen cents a pound. At least but not 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 one that's locally grown. It's green. It's uh it, it's all of those things that you could get at the at the farmers market. There's nothing like that. This is something that's that's locally grown. Um, it could benefit local economies. I mean, it could do a lot for you know the the people that are in the area where this fish is being harvested, and it could be on the plate of all those uh, people in that local community. So I think that I think that some grassroots efforts uh, to begin to 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 get this fish into markets is is really needed. And and I'm not saying that we're not there on on some scales, but we need to do a better job of of trying to get this get this going locally, um, and then stepping it up into you know into a, a state and then to a country and then to the world. We need to start somewhere, and 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 what we've done up to this point is good, but we just need to keep we need to keep building on we need to keep building on those markets to make this where it is. Um, make it where it is feasible for a commercial fisher to go out there and actually harvest the carp from the river and make some money out of doing it. So so we have like one minute left and everything yeah. you said has been great and Good. what what would you like um, what would you like for listeners of this of this interview um, what would you want them to do um, to A, help with Asian carp and B, um, just help the Mississippi River Basin in general. Yeah, so so I, I think I think the I think the biggest thing is is to be open, to keep your mind open. Um, if you get the chance to try to, to to eat some of these fish, do it. And and if you have preconceived notions about consuming Asian carp. Before you try it, all those preconceived notions up, put them in your pocket, and just try this fish for what it is. It's a delicious, white, delicate meat uh, that takes on the flavor profile of whatever whatever seasoning you throw at it. Um, from a from a bigger from a bigger perspective, um, and more from a sustainability of of all of our fisheries, you know, there's a lot of fisheries that have really that have really tanked. Uh, 
as of recent. And, you know, the demand for fish protein as a, as a source of, of, of food for our world is needed. This is a chance to, to let those stocks that, that have been depleted, and this is, this is me talking as a fishery scientist now, this is a chance to let those depleted stocks, uh, let those begin to rebound. And, and, and uh, I think that we should start, you know, start harvesting this fish as a, as a surrogate for those ones that, that have been over harvested. And then as we, as we knock this population down and those, and those stocks that have been crashed begin to make their way back, we should really think about conserving those stocks under some sustainable use mentality that, you know, don't just go out there and harvest them uh, until there's none left again. Let's do it with, uh, let's do it with science. Let's think of, let's think it through as we're, as we're harvesting these fish. Go get the carp, I say, eat, eat them, try them. They're, they're a really delicious fish to eat. And uh, that's, that's really all I got there. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today is big doc, Dr. Clinton Phelps. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.